tonight's subject is really a very vital one. We need to clearly grasp hold of the fact that the Bible alone can make us wise unto salvation. As Christadelphians, we all firmly believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. There are many inaccuracies of translation and things and minor things like that. But the, the overall message of the Bible will stand the test of any critic that likes to examine it. As we begin tonight's consideration, I'd like to take you initially back to the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1 tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the whole of the Bible is really based upon that statement of truth. Why did God create the heavens and the earth? Well, he tells us in, in the book of Numbers, chapter 14 and verse 21, where he, he says, the, it is his purpose with this earth to fill it with his glory. Numbers 14 and chapter 21 states, But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. That is the purpose for which he created it. And he tells us here, giving us every assurance that that is his purpose with this earth. So we read in Genesis, as we read through Genesis chapter 1, we're not going to read through it now at the moment, we're just briefly touching on these things to lay a foundation for our remarks. Genesis chapter 1 speaks of the creation of Adam and then the creation of Eve out of a bone taken out of the side of Adam. Why did he make them? Well, you see, it's his purpose to fill this earth with his glory. Now the creation around us, the heavens above us, declare the glory of God. It shows his mighty power, his wisdom, and his care that he has for all the creatures that he had created. We read at the end of chapter 1, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So everything was very good. The whole of his creation was harmoniously working together and declaring the glory, the power, and the wisdom of Almighty God. But you see, part of God's glory is his character. Moses asked God to show him his glory. And in Exodus chapter 34, we read of where that glory was actually revealed unto him. Exodus chapter 34, and the Lord descended, in, in verse 5, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that by no means will clear the guilty. And so we learn from that that not only is Almighty God very powerful, not only is he very wise, not only is he very skillful, but he is a moral being. And he displays a very beautifully, beautiful, balanced character. How is he going to work that glory into his creation? Well, we read in verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1, that God, or the word there for God, really implies his angels, 
his servants, his messengers, and they said one to another, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And so it was God's purpose that the man and the woman that he had created and the offspring that was to come from them, it was his desire that they, they mentally and morally they should be reflections of himself. He was made in the physical image. In verse 26 we read that, that he was to be not only bear the, the physical image, but he was also to manifest the likeness. But in verse 27 we read, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Because you see, the mental and moral likeness of Almighty God was something that was going to have to be developed in the human pair. When we come into Genesis chapter 3, we see that God put, his, put the man and the woman to a test. Were they going to cleave to his commandments? Because in verse 17 they'd been given one command. Chapter 2, verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. In chapter 3, we read of the serpent. It says he was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman pointed out in verse 3, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. And he utterly deceived the woman. He talked the woman into believing that it was perfectly legitimate and there were many advantages for her if she ate the fruit of that tree. She was put to the test. And we read there in, in verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves apron. Sin had entered into the world. And the man and the woman had become mortal. They'd fallen from their very good state. And the whole of nature became, became changed because of that. You see, in the, in, the, in the original condition, no animals fed upon other animals. All the animals, including lions and tigers and things like that, all ate the herb of the field and everything was living harmoniously together and peace was the order of the day but now a new force had entered into the creation of, Al of almighty God Adam and Eve were mortal sinners the ground was cursed as a result it was going to bring forth thistles and thorns instead of instead of um, the things that, that Adam and Eve would be trying to cultivate. Great changes had taken place. So that we read in Psalm 49, for example. Psalm 49 and verse 16. The psalmist says, Be not afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lived he blessed his soul, and men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. Man that is in honour and understandeth not, 
is like the beasts that perish. That's the lot now of fallen man. The man that understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. So without understanding of divine things, there's no difference between a man without that understanding and the beasts. They're all going to perish. But what does the New Testament say in that regard? We come to what is probably a very well-known verse, John chapter 3 and verse 16, where we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, God was so involved with, the, with his ultimate purpose which was where all his love was focused upon, the achievement of his purpose, and to fill this earth with his glory, not with the glory of man, but with his glory. For that purpose he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So you see, although man had fallen, although sin and, sin and death had entered into the world, Although the man and the woman had embraced the reasoning of a beast of the field, they became like beasts themselves. And without an understanding of God's will and God's purpose, they, like the beasts, perish. Man was created for a higher destiny than that. You see, God wants them to have everlasting life. He wants to populate this earth with immortal human beings who are at one with him mentally and morally and at that stage physically as well. But how is that going to be accomplished? See we have not been left without hope. There we are, that verse there gives us a very real hope that if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ if we believe in the things that God has accomplished through him, then people who believe and understand those things, God does not want them to perish. He wants them to have everlasting life. You see, God has a particular purpose in view. We could liken it unto a man who wants to set up a business. To set up that business he needs very skilled men, skilled in certain, uh, certain aspects that are going to be very, very necessary in the building up and the running of his business. He's going to need perhaps, shall we say, just for an example, a thousand, thousand workers in that business. That's his objective, to build it up so he's got a thousand skilled, dedicated workers in that business to ensure the success of that business. So he advertises for staff. He gets 3,000 people apply. Is he going to change his plans and give them, give the whole 3,000 work? No, he's going, to, he's going to sort them out. He's going to discern who are the most suitable ones to fulfill the purpose that he has in mind. And he will select those and he will reject the others. Hasn't Almighty God got the right to do the same? He is the possessor of heaven and earth. Everything belongs to him. He brought everything into existence. It's his. He wants to fill this globe with his glory. Not the glory of man, but his own glory. And so he put in place a very wise scheme of salvation. He wants people who acknowledge what they are. People who acknowledge that Adam and Eve did the wrong thing. They did the wrong thing. They had been told to have dominion over the beasts of the field. 
but they embraced the thinking and the disposition of the serpent and rejected the things that God had told them not to do. But see, God did not abandon his purpose. He changed the circumstances on the earth because of the changed condition of the man and the woman and all their posterity. He changed the conditions to suit the circumstances that had arisen. And he set about to develop a community of people who showed the right disposition, the right skills, to be able to, that he might be able to fulfill his purpose. And to do that, you're not left without hope, and that hope was taught from the very early pages of the Bible. Just look at, firstly, at Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13 and verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after the lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward, eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed for ever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Chapter 15 and verse 6. See, there was one problem. Abraham and Sarah were growing older and older all the time. And they had no children. They had no children. How then was God going to give that land to Abraham and his seed? Because he had no seed. And by nature, it was becoming what would be looked upon as impossible for them to have seed because of the age to which they grew before any child was born to them. And in verse 3 we read, Abram here is speaking to Almighty God who, who, had, who had brought him a message. And Abram said, Behold to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in mine house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Which means, of course, that if God was going to count him as righteous, all his sins and shortcomings had to be blotted out. And so the principle right from the very beginning was established. That righteousness would be imputed by to those who manifested faith. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 4 where we find the Apostle Paul commenting on this event, these events in um, the book of Genesis. Romans chapter 4 verse 18 who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, who was ninety, 
He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for the, his sake alone that it was imputed to him. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. When we consider those words we come to see the wisdom that God built into his plan of salvation. He wants people that are going to reflect his glory. He wants people that are going to honour him by believing what he says. You think of it, Abraham a hundred years old. His body now dead as far as uh, the principles of procreation go. Sarah's 90 years old. And it ceased to be with her after the manner of women. And God says, you're going to have a son. Sarah's going to bear you a son. And you'll call his name Isaac. And he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. And he was strong in faith giving glory to God. He was fully persuaded that what God promised he was able also to perform. He's the type of person that's ideal for his purpose. You see, we live in a, a world, na the nature around us, the the handiwork of God around us, the heavens above us, the stars, the universe. You can believe what you like about how it all came into being. But there's one thing you can't get round. It cries out to us. It, 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 the, 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 the principle that runs right through it all is intelligent design. You can ask the question, where did the intelligence come from? The Bible says it's a fool that says in his heart there is no God. We're surrounded by that evidence. And those who are interested enough to do so to open this book and start to read it find themselves introduced to the source of that intelligence. As our chairman said earlier, quoting from John chapter 17 and verse 3, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. How can we come to know God? How can we come to know Jesus Christ whom he sent? In a, we've been given a book whereby we can come to know them. We can come absolutely convinced that God exists. We can come absolutely convinced of what his character is like. We come convinced of of how he acts under different circumstances. His judgments, his care, his loving care that he shows to those who acknowledge his supremacy and his righteousness in all things. That's how we can come to know God. And the same applies to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just to say, well, you know, I, I believe that he did walk the earth 2,000 years ago, but I don't really know much else about him. We can open this book and we can see how he was, a reflection of his father's character. But leave that book shut and you'll never, know, never learn any of those things.
things. See, we'll just let's take a look at, at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 starts off in verse 1 and it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. We've seen something of the faith of Abraham. But in verse 6, the apostle says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And he goes through many examples here through this chapter of men who manifested great faith in days gone by. Now when we're looking at faith, we find that there is a close relationship between believing and having faith. Faith starts with us believing that this word is indeed the inspired word of God. It grows as we, as we come to look see the great and precious promises that God has made to mankind. As we come to understand his purpose, our belief becomes more fixed in our minds until we submit to the ways of God. The Bible says, believe and be baptised and thou shalt be saved. So to get baptised is the first of the works of faith. Because we come absolutely, totally convinced that God does exist. That he will fulfil his promises. That he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so that belief now becomes a motivating force in our life. Abraham was put to a very great test. In due course, Isaac was born. And he'd grown into a, a young man. And God says to him, says to Abraham, I want you to take Isaac to a particular place and offer him as a burnt offering. Let's just read what Paul says about it. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, he was put to a test, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. How did Abraham react when he was told those things? Told to take him and offer him as a burnt offering? He says, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. You see, God had previously told Abraham that in Isaac, his seed was going to come through Isaac. Now Isaac's a young man, but he wasn't married. He had no children. And until he got a wife, there was no prospect of him having any children. So Abraham reasoned. Now God's told me that, that the seed's going to come through Isaac. Now he's told me to kill him. If God's going to be true to his word, he will have to raise him up from the dead. And Abraham, without hesitation, you read the account in Genesis chapter 22, he rose up early in the morning and set out on that journey. And of course, when he was at the point of going to, going to cut his throat and burn him on the altar, God intervened and told him to stop. And as a result, that promise of the land and, and so forth then became an oath. So Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 6 that it became impossible for that promise not to be fulfilled. That's the sort of people that God is looking for. People put, put such absolute trust 
in what God has said that in this case this man was willing to put his son to death because God had told him to do so so you see we can see the wisdom in God's plan he's going to finish up with all the people he needs manifesting the characteristics that he wants to see manifested in them let's just look at, have a look at what the Bible says about the word of God Psalm 119 and verse 9 Psalmist asks the question wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way he says and he gives the answer by taking heed according to thy word that is God's word the word of God is the instrument that he has put into the hands of man that they might develop the characteristics that he really wants to see in his people just go to John chapter 6 and verse 63 he said it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now as long as this book sits on the shelf and we never look at it, it remains ink on paper. When we open it up and start to read it and to think about it, and to seek to know more about what it's got to say then it becomes spirit it becomes a force within us urging us in, in the right direction and they are life so the word of God Christ said the words that I speak unto you they are spirit and they are life that is, if we get hold of them, if we believe them, and if we seek to understand what it's trying to tell us, they become a living force within us. Verse 67, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, many of his disciples left him because they couldn't understand what he was saying in John chapter 6. Then Simon, uh, so. Then said Jesus unto them, unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe that thou art, the, thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Or reading from verse 15 he's, he's writing to the Romans and he, and he says so much as in me is I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ why not for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith how do we get faith Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10 verse 16 but have they not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. There's only one place, one source of faith, by hearing the word of God. And by seeking out the, the depths of God's word and of God's purpose with this earth. James chapter 1 verse 17 every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the father of lights with whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning of his own will 
begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of God, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness or teachableness the engrafted or implanted word which is able to save your souls or your lives. So once again we see that it is the word of God that begets us to a way of life that is acceptable in the eyes of Almighty God. It's the word of God that is, has the power to save our lives. It is the power of God unto salvation. So let's come now to the chapter we was read in our hearing this evening. See in chapter verse twenty-three of chapter one of the first epistle of Peter. Again, Peter impresses upon us. It says, being born or begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth for ever. He says, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth for ever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So you see, the Apostle Paul points out that all flesh is as grass. The grass springs up. It, it, it lasts for a short while. Then when the summer comes on, it withers up and, and dries up and withers away. The flower, exactly the same. Flowers just burst open and beautify the countryside for a short while, it's all over until the next year. In the case of, of the grass, because then the next generation of grass springs up. But you see, he emphasizes, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And so you see, what God wants to see is people who recognize the mortality and the sinfulness of human nature that recognise they're only here in this life for a, the span of their mortal life and they put away, they repudiate the word of God that can beget us to a new life a life which can carry on beyond death not people die they're put in the grave and that's the finish of them. The Bible tells us that when they die, their, their, their thoughts perish. They're gone forever. Unless God's word has wrought in them the disposition that he wants to see in people who are, are fit vessels qualified vessels to manifest the glory of God in the future age. And when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, those people will be resurrected from the dead and stand before the judgment seat of Christ and if found worthy, they will be clothed with immortality or divine nature and live forever with the Lord Jesus Christ upon this earth. So the Apostle says in chapter 2 and verse 1, Wherefore laying aside all malice, all guile, all and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, things that spring out of the human nature with which we were born, and as newborn babes, begotten by the word of truth, desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye might grow thereby. Having been begotten by the word, 
We're dependent upon the word of God that we might grow and develop that godly character that Almighty God wants to see in each and every one of us. It's a very privileged position that those who believe the word of God stand in. Verse 9. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, because when God's kingdom is established upon the earth, the redeemed from this epoch of time will be associated with the Lord Jesus Christ and with, and with him will reign as kings and priests on this earth over the mortal mortals that will still be on the earth in that thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're a holy nation. He says, you're a holy nation. A peculiar, or we'd better render a purchased people, redeemed by the blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, in verse 19 of chapter 1. And why? What is, the, what is the, God's purpose with, with this people that he's purchased? that ye should show forth the praises, or the margin says, the virtues of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. What a wonderful privilege we have if we embrace the word of God, if we acknowledge God's supremacy, his righteousness, and if we praise him for his love, his care, wonderful things he has promised for the future. See, that promise to Abraham that he will be given the land will be fulfilled when Christ returns to this earth. The promise he made to King David for, to have a son that would sit upon his throne and rule the world from Jerusalem will be fulfilled when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to this earth. And David and Abraham and many others will be brought out of the grave Resurrected, they will stand again on the earth and be given eternal life and spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. May it be, friends, that every one of us will heed the message of God's word that we might be built up and prepared for the day of the Lord's return to this earth.